Hello, one day is Thursday, June 15, 2023, and this is the week in charts. I'm just going to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I forgot once again to promote it this week. If you are watching a recording of it, thank you. Like the video if you like it. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. I'm half kidding. And subscribe to the YouTube channel while you're there. If you want to attend live, davelander.com slash webinar. So thank you guys and girls for attending tonight. Appreciate that. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading and your favorite stock and crypto picks. We'll do crypto first, and then we'll jump into stocks. Once we get to the live charts, feel free to start asking about stocks. If you ask before that, it might get caught up, uh, mixed up in the questions, and I might not see it. And then ask about one ticker at a time, hit enter. Uh, tonight, uh, this was kind of a last minute thing. And then I realized that it's last minute, last, you know, three or four hours ago, I started thinking about this. And then I realized it's going to be pretty massive. So tonight is probably just going to be an intro to it. Uh, and that should be AN intro two. That's a slide I just put in <laughs> 10 seconds before we went live. And that'll make sense in uh, one minute. I want to quick, do a quick follow up on the VIX. Kind of much ado about nothing. And then uh, touch upon free rolling once again. All right, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I like to sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen to me now. And then I borrowed that from Greg Morris. All right, let's talk about how to fail at trading. Well, any motivational guru worth their weight in salt will tell you that things aren't brought about by thinking about their opposite. However, I think it's important to know if you're making mistakes and why you're making mistakes and you have to recognize this i think that's and again i think we're just going to scratch the surface tonight in fact as i was i was looking for a quote that i really wanted and i'll, I'll have to find and i'll tell you that quote in a minute or paraphrase and um actually i can't paraphrase it anyway while looking for that quote, I found some writing that I did. I have an, on, on another monitor over here, and I've got another 10 or 20 of these things listed. So I think we're just going to start scratching the surface on this tonight. I think one of the biggest things, and one thing I didn't talk about tonight is being undercapitalized, but we'll get to that in, in future presentations. But one of the biggest things is that you don't give yourself enough time to learn. And... The question here is, how long did it take you to become a doctor, lawyer, or automatic transmission mechanic? And you probably say, well, Dave, how long does it take to become a trader? And the answer is, I don't know. That That is really up to you. And the reason I say I don't know is there's no defined career path. So let's say you want to fly an airplane. Well, you're going to go to class for a while, and you're going to learn about how airplanes work on the ground where it's nice and safe. And then eventually you'll get out in an airplane with someone else and then someday you'll solo. There's a whole list of things to do. If you want to become a plumber, there's a, a long list of things you do. I know someone that, that gave up on uh, their job because it was a very depressing job and became a plumber. And I remember calling him a couple of months later and said, hey, I got some issues. You want to come over? He's like, no, I'm not a plumber yet. It's, it'll be a while. And, and I know he went like five years or so. And I wasn't sure if he was uh, a made official plumber after all those years, but it's a long drawn out process. And, and if ever, a, if ever it sounds like I'm making fun of like a, an automatic transmission mechanic or something, it's like, no, I'm actually flattered that you know how to fix a transmission. I, I'm impressed with people who could still fix things and make things. And um, I, I used to live out in the country where everybody else is kind of, everybody else there is self-sufficient. But now that I'm in the city, uh, people are bringing me stuff <laughs> at least once a week to fix it. Uh, I got a contractor. If he gets in a jam, he'll bring me like a beam or something. He's like, I need to cut to this, 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 or whatever. And then I'll cut it for him and, and give it back to him. And, and I'm always <laughs> fixing stuff. He was using a nail gun the other day. And he, he hands it to me over the fence and he goes, fix this. And so I fiddle with it a little bit, fix it, and give it back to him. Anyway, I'm not bragging because I believe me, I, I, I muck up a lot of stuff. But I, I'm amazed with people who can still fix things in this day and age. There's not a whole lot of us left. And I consider myself as part of being one of those. But anyway, getting back to this, there's really no defined career path when it comes to being a trader. And I, I've kind of sought out, sought to do this. And I think I have done this fairly well with my members area. And I'm not soft selling you, but maybe I am. 
it, you guys here are already in the members are all members so it doesn't matter but and non-members are welcome to these webinars by the way uh davelander.com slash webinar once again but anyway i i think i've mapped out a lot of things that you have to do a lot of things that you need to do along uh, to become a trader and it, it's in the war it's like as i started working on this tonight and and 30 minutes ago i'm like this this is there's so much to cover here it's going to take a long long time but i think that let's get the ball rolling and scratch the surface a little bit tonight now one thing you do is you you miss the forest for the trees and, and i'm as guilty as anyone of a lot of these behaviors believe me but it's more i think it's more painful for me because i know i shouldn't be doing these things it's like uh what did livermore once say a speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows he is making them as i've told the story a thousand times had a client wasn't making money he wanted me to go through all his trades and and show him that to serve why i wasn't making money or whatever long story endless i pulled out all the service trades and they were actually profitable and he took every one and followed them to a t and i noticed that he had 20 something day trades and i pointed that out to him and he lost five thousand dollars on that and, and his answer surprised me he says i know i know but anyway getting back to missing the forest for the trees that's where you're trying to catch every zig and zag and the old adage be as close to the market as you need to be but no closer now i'm doing way too much of the intraday stuff admittedly and i used to not do those things so you know maybe on rare occasions something like an opening gap reversal or if i just couldn't stand it but now i'm doing more and more things and a lot of experimenting with a lot of different things and as i've said before i noticed that when i accidentally changed my charts from five to 15 minutes i backed way off on that hyper activity and i couldn't figure out why it was taking so long to to get something that looked like it was worth trading or whatever and it's because i'd moved my charts out to 15. And i've since moved them out to 30 minutes and that has helped me quite a bit to not chase my own tail but the zig and zag for the most part for the forest for the trees the zig the zag what i'm where i'm going with this is i've been doing a lot of presentations on livermore lately i think we're up to seven or eight eight will be next week or week after and one of the things he talks a lot about is the big pull when he was in the bucket shops he was in and out day trading and that environment lended itself to that type of action because they were getting an instantaneous quote and they were be they were able to trade off that quote now the quote might have been 10 minutes old or an hour old but they would trade off the quotes that came into the bucket shop and it was much easier for them to day trade in that type of situation now just to kind of talk about big picture and where the money is and and when livermore went to new york he initially lost money because he was he found out his method was kind of chasing your own tail in real markets he would send out an order would come back filled 20 points lower and then he'd, he'd send out an order to to buy they come come back 20 points higher or whatever the case may be anyway he talks a lot about the big pull and that's really got me thinking about where the money is and, and the money is in the longer term trend following and that's why i take this hybrid approach to the money and position management when i get into a position i'll walk you through that in one second but just want to kind of throw in the tfm 10 percent system now the cues backed off a little bit i took this snapshot about um five minutes before the close and they backed off a little bit going into close but you'll get the idea so this is a tfm 10 percent system this is a weekly chart and bar one bar two remember two bars above the 50 week simple moving average and closing within 10 percent of the 50 week closing high and that's the entire system right there on the sell side you just sell when it crosses below the buy line or 10 percent away from the 50-week closing high and the 50-week moving average so that would be a sell right there and the idea of the system is to get you out of markets in bad times and avoid the big slide like somebody said well what good was the signal not this signal but the um the COVID symbol, uh, signal during the pandemic. Well, the market dropped like 30% after the signal. So I thought that was a pretty good signal. 
But anyway, it does a pretty good job of getting you back in when you have a longer term bottoming type of market. There are other ways to get into a market when they're not, but this is kind of waking me up to the fact that, hey, I'm gonna follow this longer term system with a small part of my money. And that way I'm participating in the broader market movements. So see the forest for the trees. So there's a the trade right there, 100 shares, just 100 shares, 319.49. Uh, and based on where I took the snapshot, it's 50 points in the queues times 100, just 100 shares. And it's $5,000. So it's better than Pokemon. So I'm going to follow this and see what's happened. I'm totally making money in the queues since the TFM system. Oh, well, thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. Thanks for the shout out. Now, another way you fail is you micromanage. Uh, just one more thing on the forest for the trees. There's, there are days where I might chase my own tail. And at the end of the day, I look at the chart. And it's like it's a little bitty tiny bar on the chart. It's like, why did I try to go in and out all day like the rat going for the cocaine when it asked, it didn't do anything? And then the other thing would be like some days it just goes up. If you look at a daily chart, it's just a perfect uptrend, perfect up bar, wide range bar up. And I'll fail to make money. And it's because I'm too busy looking too close to the screen. So be as close to the market as you need to be. One of the biggest sins I see, and I'm, I'm tempted by personally, but I, I I follow the system. It's it's easy for me to follow the trading service because I lay it all out. And I know that you guys are in it too. So it, it's kind of my own commitment device. And it, it's it, when I show you a stock like SYM, we hadn't had a lot of winners in a while. And that's because the market's going mostly sideways. We also have sat in our hands for a long time and not do anything. And that's one of the how you fail at trading, trading too, is you lose your patience and you go off the system surf. And we'll talk about that in coming weeks. But anyway, micromanagement is a big is a big deal. And the old commodity adage comes to mind, eat like a bird and shit like an elephant. And a lot of people will will take, new traders at least, will take a small gain and end up taking a huge loss. And by the way, if you're trading a pure reversion to the mean type of system, a lot of your, your gains, you'll be highly accurate, but then every now and then you'll get killed and the gains don't make up for that occasional huge loss. You exit at the first signs of adversity. I hate to ask because I'm sure some people bailed out. And thank God, I see a couple of you here stayed with it. But a lot of times, as soon as a market begins to go against someone, they bail out. Now, I'm not saying hold on for dear life. But if your stop is not hit, then stick with the position until proven wrong by getting stopped out. So we bought somewhere in here, and this thing immediately, after a little bit of a pop, began to crater. I wouldn't say crater, it began to sell off, and it sucked. And the old me, before I did the trading service, 27 years ago, I guess, <laughs> geez, I'm getting old, probably would have bailed out and got really, really pissed off, and probably would have dropped an F-bomb and said, F this. And then you can see that it took off afterwards. At this point, you're thinking, mother, father. Why are those coaches always saying that on the sidelines? What the? I always talk about their mother and their father. Anyway, so a lot of times you bail out. Now, we have one, we have a couple in the books. I'll show you a spreadsheet in a second that are underwater, but that's okay. Let's just see how it shakes out. All you need is one or two of these a year to to make your year now this is one i've been working on a lot i've been doing a lot of writing on this i'm probably up to about a thousand handwritten pages maybe more because i'm that's just in new my new uh, digital notebook which is about a year old and I have a lot of other writing too and one of the biggest things is extraneous influences that have nothing to do with the market. 
Tom Clellan's mother, Mary McClellan, par paraphrased, once said, everybody uses timing in their investments. Some people buy when they have money investing. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And others use far more sophisticated methods. Have you ever had a big win on a trade and you're feeling flush? And then all of a sudden you lose in the next few trades. And then you look at those next few trades and realize, boy, those those were just mediocre. And you, you knew it at the time. You were just throwing your money away because you were lottery rich, so to speak. Sell when you need money. Sometimes you might have to, you might need money. It seems like we always need money, right? So you might sell when you need money. And those two things have nothing to do with timing the market properly, at least. Now, you might get in a fight with your, your wife, your girlfriend, or your significant other, or maybe both. <laughs> and I'm guilty of this. It's like, uh, you know, go in the house and, and uh, you know, she's lying like a crocodile waiting for me, you know. <laughs> anyway. Thinking I'm going in there to relax, get a Diet Coke, or have lunch or whatever. <laughs> anyway, so it's like I'll come back in here and I'll be like, ah, oh, I'll show her, you know. And then it's kind of then it becomes kind of like she'll never know. <laughs> actually, when I was writing about this, she actually gave me that line, she'll never know. And uh I didn't tell her, but there's been times where I thought, yeah, she'll never know. <laughs> By the way, uh, another story along the lines of um, this one particular client. He gives me about 90% of my material. I might have to pay him to just remain a client, you know, just so I have material for these presentations in books. But uh, he's actually been with me forever, 20 years probably. Uh, he's he he was he was a big fan of Haggerty back in the day, and he knew me from back then. Anyway, uh, he was having some trouble at one point in time. And I'm like, look, you know what you're doing, and you're really good at what you do. Why don't you show your wife my trading service, tell her who I am, have her watch a video or two if she can stand it, and say, look, I'm following this guy, and he's not always right, but you know where you stand. And he's wrong a lot, but every now and then he catches a big winner or two, and that's the whole system is just chipping away at it till you catch the occasional home run. And I'm just going to follow what he says in his trading service, and I'll show you everything I do. And then his reply was was kind of uh, shocking. He said, oh, no, that would end the marriage. And it would end the marriage because he would be doing a lot of things that are outside of what what he should be doing. So you do need to hold yourself accountable. I probably shouldn't say she'll never know. I probably should tell her, hey, look, I screwed up. I was stupid. But um, there's no need for that. <laughs> so you let the situation in Nigeria cloud your judgment. I was thinking recently, I think about this all the time. I need some new stories. I need to get out. Long story endless on that was I was speaking at Traders Expo probably 10 years ago. And I was bearish on energies, and I was short a few uh, that were also short in the service. And somebody screamed out, what about the situation in Nigeria? And he sounded like Henry Kissinger. And I'm like, what about the situation in Nigeria? And I meant it kind of like, uh, <laughs> I wasn't asking for a reply. And he went into uh, OPEC and uh, Venezuela, and he went on to talk about the situation in Nigeria. Well, I stayed short the stocks. and. I did okay in spite of the situation in Nigeria. I I was trying to look, I found a quote earlier today from uh, Pew. The only problem with, um, you go to these digital notebooks like this, and like I said, I've got a thousand pages just on the, the book I'm working on. And it's hard to find stuff because it, it, you can't search for handwriting, but a person, uh, I got the name of Burton Pew. I have his one of his books here. I haven't read it all. I just read a little bit of it. And that's probably where I got it. I couldn't find it before it went live. But he had a really good quote about weather and and trading wheat. If you trade commodities, their weather affects how the co commodities grow, obviously. And it was a really good quote about how everybody has the weather forecast and and it 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 doesn't work. As basically he was saying, 
news is noise. And and that's why I really wish you could find it because it's a lot more eloquent than um, than the way I'm trying to explain it. But you can't let the, the news cloud your judgment. And, you know, one thing I wanted to put in here tonight, but just ran out of time, is part of the reason you fail at trading or some fail at trading is that you you fail to realize the only way to make money. And the only way to make money is to capture a price move, okay? It doesn't matter what the situation in Nigeria is. You just have to capture a price move. And the participants, how they come to their conclusion, I know Greg Morris has done some writing on this in um, Investing with the Trend, but how they come to their conclusion, news, fundamentals, whatever, or a fight with their spouse, significant other, or both, doesn't matter. It's what they actually do that matters. So it's what the market is showing, the charts are showing that they did. And then, you know, not to digress too far, I don't imagine that. But the charts, you can actually read the psychology of the player. Something like a TKO, you got a nice trend, so you know there's demand. You've got the knockout bar, so you know that the Johnny from Lately's have been knocked out. Maybe some longer term trend followers have been knocked out and some shorts have been attracted in. Now, if that market reverses, it triggers an entry, then those people who were knocked out have to put up a shut up and the shorts who are now at a loss are going to have to buy in. And shorts have a big ego. They confuse the issue with facts quite often. And maybe they're thinking about the situation in Nigeria or whatever, or the crappy fundamentals of the stock. And they are not going to cover when that market makes new highs. They're going to cover much later or much longer down the line. Eventually, they're going to get forced out. And then that can create the market to go parabolic, which is really cool with that pattern sometimes. Now, I, don't, I forget who, um, I'm trying to think, of, uh, it's a woman who said this. I can't think of her name, but she said that we don't see things as they are we see them as we are. So putting that to markets, we don't see things as, my phones are on because uh, I've been fighting with Microsoft for a week. <laughs> I'm trying to get a call back from tech support. I'm locked out of my email. But anyway, I forget who said it, but uh, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. And the same thing happens with markets. We don't see markets as they are, you see them as you are. And you really have to work hard to see what is. And what is, is. Van Thorpe had a similar line. We get out of the market what we want. Let me think about that a little bit. So he's, but that's not saying that you're seeing the market for what it is. And I stumbled across this quote earlier that I wanted to work into this writing that I'm working on from Annie Duke. And her book, Thinking of Bet, was really good. I, I got her book on decisions. I haven't gotten into it yet. And it's, I started reading a little bit, but it's a lot of workbook type of book. And I don't always work well with that type of book. But anyway, this was in Thinking of Bets, I'm pretty sure. Now, this might be a little bit of a paraphrase. I'll have to confirm it. But she said, instead of altering our beliefs to fit the new information, we alternate our terp we alter alternate alternate our interpretation of that information to fit our beliefs. And that's again thinking in bets, I'm pretty sure. Once you have a dog in a fight, you know, skin in a game, everything changes. If you're let's say you're long a stock and it's gone down it's going down it's going down then it goes up a couple ticks you're like oh, oh it's reverse it's reverse nothing to worry about everything's going to be fine right and then it starts going down again you might justify why it's going down or whatever but what it is is and that's a tough one sometimes separating yourself away like linda rasky once said which i was attributed to saying because i said it so many things is like if you don't know where a market is headed ask a six-year-old kid because a six-year-old kid doesn't care about the earnings, the fundamentals of the situation in Nigeria, and so on and so forth. They're just going to look at the chart and see if it's going up or down or sideways, right? 
So you people with uh, six-year-old kids, you have an unfair advantage. <laughs> All right, I'm just, I realize I'm just scratching the surface on this, and it's like I almost ditched it after a couple hours in, even though I have so much material, but I keep finding new material to go with this how to fail a trade. And I know it's a negative, but you need to recognize when these things are happening, obviously. All right, let's talk about how to su succeed at trading. Free rolling, the secret to longer term success. Yeah, I never fully understood that that line. We get out of the market what we want, because I don't, get i'm not always getting out the market what i want <laughs> but i i think i, I see where you're going uh, from that uh, some people looking for excitement that's another way to fail at trading by the way and uh, maybe the market will give you some excitement so brian says sim was up 100 percent for a while today good call on that one yeah i was up like six points earlier and i was like um uh, I did get a little caught up watching that screen and I'm like, wow, look at that, six points, another six points, that's fantastic. And then when it came back in, I was a bit of, a bit bummed out. It did, it did, uh, it did, I think it ended up a point and change by the end of the day. No, no, 40 something cents. Anyway, free rolling, I've been talking a lot about that. That's a secret to longer term trading success. As I said, ad nauseum, short term trading doesn't make enough, even though it's more accurate and less risky. The only problem is every now and then you get whacked, okay? Longer term trading, you're more likely to get whacked, but you're also more likely to capture a longer term trend. Big trends take time to develop. So if you, let's say you're out of the market like this within two weeks, or let's say uh, close to a swing trade uh, time frame, like five days, then you missed the mother of all moves. Well, so far. Anyway, it was in a... Uh, longer term uptrend as you can see and it was more of a gradual uptrend it began to accelerate higher that's a pattern i call accelerating momentum strategy most of my stuff as you might know as most as everybody here knows is is pullback related for the most part there's a couple of breakout patterns here and there but most of it is pullback related it's all trend following and notice that it's very persistent there's another pattern i have called the persistent pullbacks i'm going to go through this kind of quickly because We've covered a few times already. And then it pulls back to the moving average. That's a Landry light pullback. And if you look at the illustrator below, it's an indicator, but it doesn't indicate anything. It just tells you what's already in the chart, right? It tells you how many days the market was above that moving average. In this case, we're using a 30 EMA. And you can see that it goes to zero when it pulls back to the moving average and the count starts over. If it's flipping back between green and red, then the market has become choppy. If it's mostly green longer term, then it's still in a longer term trend. Anyway, we did hit the initial profit target. And at that point, we took partial profits or we banked $1,000 on 100K account. And I think I took the trades out, but I had some trades here that I use in my model account for this trade. And I, I showed them last week in the week of charts. So if you want to go and look at that one. Anyway, so the, like I was saying a minute ago, just getting, just make sure I close the loop on that. I was talking about short term trading doesn't make enough, less risky, more accurate. Longer term trading, abysmal accuracy, abysmal drawdowns. But that's where the money is. You're going to have to sit for a while in a market if you ever want to get a 500% or a 600% gain. Doesn't happen that often, but it happens often enough to make it worthwhile. And it usually happens right about the time you're about to give up on this trend following bullshit. <laughs> but anyway, so what we do, just in case we just get that swing trade and it comes right back in, we bank half, okay? And we're risking 2% if stopped out, not 2% on price movement, because a lot of stocks we trade will do 2% in just a few minutes, right? But once we're up 2% overall on the position, so with a 100K account, you're up $2,000, then we'll bank half of that. Our stop comes to break even immediately, okay? This is not intended to be a full money management lesson, but just kind of give you the crux of it. And then we trail a stop more loosely on the remainder. Now, when I took this snapshot, this was yesterday. So yesterday, 
it was at 3,296, and here's a spreadsheet. And I think uh, BTBT dipped into the negative column. So we've got one out of three winners. You can see my accuracy is abysmal. I don't care. I don't care as long as this one keeps on keeping on. So like Brian was saying earlier, it was up over 100% at one point total today. So not a bad trade. And I hate to... I hate to use this term because it's kind of a negative gambling term, but once you're in that free roll mode, once you, and then barring overnight gaps, obviously, but once you're in a free roll mode, you're kind of playing with the market's money and you just sort of have to let things shake out. Sometimes you might have to close your eyes a bit. Now, I was telling my clients tonight that be prepared for a pullback here. And in this pullback here, in in another presentation, I showed how much that was, but that's thousand bucks or so evaporated overnight. Okay, well it happens, but you're still ahead where you were when you started. Okay, on the trade, and then we had what's that? Uh, I think there's 200 shares left per 100k on this. It was up six points earlier, so 12. So you were up 1200 earlier today, just today, and then it backed off to where you were actually losing a little bit of money. So you had a $1,200 swing and it's hard and, and it's hard to, to, to stomach those swings, but it comes with the territory and you have to be willing to do that if you wanna participate in something longer term. Now, this, is, this stock has a little bit of an AI element to it. They probably added AI to the, <laughs> to the stock, uh, to the company description once uh, AI took off, but who cares? It's kind of like the companies added .com to their name and then they went up 100 extra percent in 1999. But let's say that AI is a real deal with this thing and AI is the next big thing, then we could be just getting started with this. I don't know, we'll find out. Hopefully without too much effing around. I tell them more, I tell them more if she loves that, that's a new thing. F A F O. All right. Any questions on all that uh, stuff? I'm gonna. I promise I'll flesh out the um, the how to fail at trading and and tell you how not to fail at trading at the same time over in, over the coming weeks because there's a there's a I have a ton of material on this stuff. Okay. So last week I talked a lot about how stretched the VIX was. You know how concerned I was about that. And then this week, you're probably wondering, well, that was much to do about nothing. And it's like, well, no need to cover the VIX because it's, it's corrected or whatever. I was like, no, I want to follow up and show them what I was thinking, what happened, and whether or not it was much to do about nothing. So just real quick, the VIX measures the implied volatility. It's all a hypothetical, but it measures the applied volatility I think it's 30 days out, which keeps rolling to 30 days every day. And it measures puts and calls. And it, it's an, a measurement of IV, in implied volatility versus historical volatility. So these option, option prices tend to skyrocket when a market begins to sell off because people look in the hedge or people looking to just dump some money into options or whatever. And then they tend to kind of dry up and get at very low levels when the market begins to rally because people become complacent. Now, if you're looking at the VIX, when it gets stretched to one direction or the other, the market tends to correct. So right here, you can see the VIX spiked up as this market imploded. And then the VIX begins to implode and the market begins to go back up. Now, as I said last week, there's a danger with absolute VIX readings. Like I said years ago, I think, well, like I said last week and probably week before that, or whenever we talk about the VIX, Larry Connors years ago had a system that was based on fixed VIX. It actually might start working again. It was like uh, sell the market when, uh, the, when the market is below 15 and buy it when it's above or something like that. And that stopped working, but when by the time I met Larry, I was able to take some of his stuff and throw moving averages in 
and I settled upon the 10 day simple and I did my own mean reversion studies. And then he, he published those as Connor's Dix reversal. Some of the, some of the stuff that uh, I helped him work on. And I also put it in my first book, I think specifically the, um, I think it's a CBR three and CBR three modified. But anyway, the market was really stretched here. You can see it was 17% away from the moving average. And like I just said, when it gets stretched to one way or the other, the market tends to reverse. So it's something to pay attention to. And my concern was that we're way up here at nosebleed levels. This is the S&P 500, by the way. And that we were due to correct and the VIX was suggesting that people were getting complacent. So, like I said last week, and this is what happened this week, does a low and a stretch VIX equal a sell-off? Well, not necessarily. It, a market could walk off the oversold condition and normalize, so to speak, to a lower level. So absolute levels are irrelevant with the VIX. Maybe years ago they worked, and that's what Larry was noodling with quite a bit. But in more recent years, since 1994, five or six whenever we work together it hasn't worked that way but you need to see it as more of a relative thing it's a joke there but i'm not going to say it so you can see we did revert back to the mean and and the, the mean also came down to meet it okay so that was the point i was making last week because of the slope was so sharp on this 10-day simple it was coming down really really quick so now we have normalized back to the moving average. So this just measures how far away you are from the moving average. And you can actually, this is the actual formula here for these. And I experimented with uh, highs and lows and opens. My open is missing for some reason, but it would just be an O. Oh, there it is, right there. So I need to put the low in here too. Anyway, you can see we're back to kind of a more normalized VIX. This doesn't mean we, we won't get a sell-off. It just means that the VIX has kind of corrected itself and now it's beginning to possibly normalize itself. I hate to say bull market, but it might be going into a bit of a bull market mode where it's less, it's less kind of panicky. So we'll just have to wait and see. But you can see the market continued higher and then the VIX has met up with this moving average. Now, the other day I pointed out in my Facebook group and I forget who said it and, and I don't wanna, I hate to say it without giving them credit, but somebody used to say, VIX up markets up, something's up. And I I did some quick little empirical research, so to speak, and I, was, I wasn't able to, to figure out or gleam anything from that. So I'm sure, he has his his reasons, but I couldn't I couldn't make that work. And his point is be cautious if from a conceptually from a conceptual standpoint, it makes some sense. What he's saying is it means that people are driving the prices of options up because something bad might be getting ready to happen in a market. Anyway, we're now back to the middle of the range, so the signal didn't do anything for us. So like I said last week, this is just, a, it's just a gauge to be careful. You know, don't fail on longs, but make sure, of course, you're waiting for entries on new ones. Make sure you're using proper stock selection. All the things you normally do, just make sure you do them even better when the market becomes complacent like that. And then you want to wait for a reversion to the mean move. You trade in the VIX itself, wait for it to begin to move. And if you're trading the market, wait for the market to start to tank. Don't pick the tops and don't pick the bottoms. Okay, let's shift gears and hop into crypto. And if there's any crypto you guys want to look at, let me know. I'll be happy to do that now. I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount on crypto tonight. Just a couple things I want to flesh out. Have you tried the IWM on a TFM system? No, I have not. But I tell you what we could do just to have some fun. Why don't we do this real quick? Let's just take a quick look at it. 
So we take a look at, I would imagine it would work. And the, the original system was based on the S&P 500. But let's take a look at that and put the Rusty in here. Okay, there's the Rusty. Okay, let's see what we got. Well, um, yeah, you would have had you would have had a system, you would have had a buy here, but that would have been a weakness. That'd have been hard to buy. But then subsequently it rallied a little bit. So yeah, technically from a mechanical standpoint, your buy would have been back here. You'd have gotten stopped out immediately. But now if everything holds tomorrow, you would have a repeat buy signal. So just casually kind of looking at it, you could see that it would have gotten you out here. And that was about a what 30 or 40 percent drop in the market. It would have gotten you out two weeks before the implosion for the pandemic. And of course, there would be some whipsaw in between. So it doesn't look like it works as well as it does in the P's. But the designer's intent, okay, always look for designer's intent, is to avoid these diaper change moments. See, here's 40%. And I think that's, I forget, I forget how this was, pro see, I miss the old days. Like if now I give somebody something like this to program, in this case, which was for stock charts, and I no longer can see the formula because sometimes I'll, I'll, have, I'll have what I want in my head and tell them, but, but I'll, every now and then you look at the formula, but I'm pretty sure this is after, this is the diaper change indicator down here, like how far it dropped. So your cell would have been right there, okay? And then it dropped down all the way to here. That's that's about 40%. So this is this number's correct. I think this is what happens after you exit the market. So I have it, uh, but it's you don't have a lot of data here with the Rusty. I don't know how far it goes back with other packages. But you can see that, you know, here's like a buy back here. You might have gotten one or two whipsaws in this big old uptrend here. What what when was this? This was uh here's a big nasty spill. Let's take a look at that. Such a nerd, you know, you could tell you got me all excited. <laughs> uh where's your cell? Right there. So that would have been a cell here. And then that was good for about what, 50%? When was that? That was 2008. Okay. So no, I haven't tried it, but I think it's I think it's conceptually correct, or I know it's conceptually correct. It should work. Um, the parameters might need to be adjusted a little bit. I just use the same parameters with the P's with the Q's. Watch your P's and Q's. And uh, knock on wood, so far so good. But I did go back and test it, uh, hand test it with the NAS with the Q's, and it uh, it did fairly well. So I thought it was worth a shot. As I say each week, when crypto is blowing and going, you can, sometimes you can go in and, and sort by relative strength and just by the stronger pairs. Right now is not that time. Crypto is all over the place. It seems like your government is on a bit of a witch hunt for some reason. Don't know why. Um, I could speculate. <laughs> I don't get audited, but um, I, I think. I think the government likes controlling things, if I had to guess, and they can't, um, it's a little out of control. Now, pay your taxes, okay? If you make money in crypto, pay your taxes for sure. But anyway, I'm not sure why, other than taxes, I'm not sure why they're they're going after it, but they are. Bitcoin doesn't look so well, okay? Now, I did find a little support in here one thing I sort of noticed with Bitcoin in more recent years, it seems like every time it tanks, it comes back. I, I think there's a demand out there. And again, the charts don't lie. So I'm not saying believe what I'm saying here. I'm just thinking deep down, there is some demand. There are people that want in. There's still a lot of people that don't know how to get in. My older relatives call me every now and then trying to figure out how to buy these Bitcoins. <laughs> But I do think there's a lot of people, and there is some institutional support that comes in, or whales, or whatever you want to call it. 
And I would never de design a system off of this, but it seems like whenever the market really tanks, it just comes back with, with more vigor. It's like the pushing the ball into water and all of a sudden just comes flying back. But do not, and I repeat, do not trade a reversion to the mean system in Bitcoin. Just an observation. But you can see highs are less than moving average. So we have downside Landry light. And by the way, as I've said a thousand times, if you don't know anything about crypto, if you don't know anything about markets, okay, plot your 50, well, you can plot your 50, plot your 30 day EMA and do not buy any market that is below the 30 EMA, okay, like that one, okay? So let's say you didn't know anything about crypto. Oh, I want to buy this one inch, okay? Well, now one inch has lost half of its value and you didn't buy it because it didn't go above the 30 EMA, okay? So you can see, don't buy any market. Now, obviously you, you need other reasons to buy, but avoid any crypto. And for the most case, a lot of stocks, unless it's a really deep retracement and a really sharp uptrend, just by not buying, the stock, as long as it's below the 30 EMA, that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. And I think that's just a good rule in general. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at the piece, okay? Now, in and of itself, that's not a complete trading system, but it sure is a good little rule to keep you out of a lot of trouble. So what are we looking at here? S&P 500, you can see above the 30 EMA, good, right? Okay, below the 30, bad. And I think if you probably went longer term with some other longer term, with like a longer term moving average or even a simple moving average, such as a 50 week simple moving average, that in and of itself would keep you out of a lot of trouble, okay? So you'd be long all this time, and then you would avoid all this time. So again, that's not a complete system in and of itself, but it's a good way to stay out of a lot of trouble. All right, so not a whole lot else to say about crypto. Let's take a look at, uh, maybe take a look at Ethereum. Okay, Ethereum looks a little worse than Bitcoin. If you ever look at Ethereum, BTC, you can see that Ethereum is definitely underperforming Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is one of the dogs with the least amount of fleas, at least at this point in time. Now, crypto changes quickly. This list was all red, and I don't think there was one. There might have been one, but out of however many I have here, two or 300 of them, not one was above the 30 EMA over the weekend. So uh, crypto got hit hard, as you know, over the weekend. So let's see what happens. Any pairs you guys want to look at? There's really nothing there. All right, let me shift gears and hop to the markets. And then you guys can start asking about individual uh, stocks if you want. I know we talk a lot about stocks in Facebook, so we don't get we don't get any stock picks. Not nearly as many as we used to. But what we could do is we can get some new people in here to ask about stocks. I like you people because you know what kind of stocks to ask about, but everybody needs to learn at some point in time. All right, let's take a look at what's going on. Hopefully it made sense. <laughs> well, it's like I had a guy who would come like every week to the week of charts and, and he would ask about stocks. Well, I'm thinking of two different guys, but like one guy would, would ask about stocks that He'd ask about a stock that, that looked like a electrocardiogram every week. And it'd be like, kind of like the peas look back here, just all over the place. I'm like, he's like, you never like anything I pick. It's like, well, pick better stocks. <laughs> yeah, John, Don. Yeah, this guy named Don used to come in all the time. I kicked him out once or twice. And he was not Don. Uh, yeah, it was Don, but he, was, he would always say, oh, Ford's looking better. He'd always, he was always asking about Ford. And usually it was going straight down. Obviously, he... Um, he must have been long Ford, but Ford in general looks like electrocardiogram. It's looking better now, but yeah, Don. <laughs> you guys remember Don? That's funny. <laughs> well, 
one guy that was new to me, uh, I kicked him out and he was like appalled. He goes, this guy's kicking out people. <laughs> I was like, eh, it's Don. <laughs> he just wants to know about Ford every week. It's making me crazy. Drive me crazy. Short trip. Hey, take a look at the peas. Look at that. Look at the peas are huge. Up a percent and a quarter today. And they're beginning to accelerate higher. Notice the land line above that 50 simple. Okay. And then now beginning to accelerate higher. Super, super duper overbought. Here's something that's really cool. And I guess the TFM system would tell us too, but let's see what it just says here. If I'm doing it right, I think we're only. That can't be right. We're we're within we're less than ten percent away. I know that because of the TFM ten percent system. You have to be within ten percent. Oh, I know why. Yeah, we're way we go. The fifty week closing high is no longer back here, so it's it's much closer to where we are now. But all time highs we're not that far away. We are within ten percent of all time highs, so that's a good thing. So far, so good. Yeah, brace for a correction, but. It's looking better. And I, I think the FOMO is going to begin to kick in. You got to realize that people don't want to be left behind. So once this thing starts going, they're going to start piling into it. And there's going to be some really bad corrections along the way to shake people out. And then the market, there's no guarantee, but might go right back up to really frustrate them. As I say each week, markets do what they have to do to frustrate the most amount of people. Also do the obvious thing in an unobvious manner. Which way is this market headed? It's obviously headed higher. What's it gonna do? Is it gonna keep going higher? No, it's gonna have a big shakeout move and then it's gonna start going higher once again. Keep the picks coming. Take a look at the Rusty. Well, Rusty's, it's been a bottoming process forever. It's having a hard time getting going. It did get above the 50. It did get above the, this is the 50 down here, I think. It did get above the 200-day moving average. So it is improving. And it's at right around these multi-month highs. So that's a good thing. But I, ideally, I like to see it make multi-year highs. Like the S&Ps are like one year plus highs. Energies are kind of wide and loose and all over the place. I would avoid these guys for now. There's too much other good stuff out there to go after the energies. Banks is something I'm watching, not because I want to buy them. I just want them to, to get off their butts. So we we possibly have dodged a bigger bullet here because of this recent, these recent lows were taken out. Looks like the pandemic lows would have been the next stop for the banks. Financials are beginning to shrug off the banks, which I think is fantastic. You can see a little Landry light there, right at these multi-month highs. That's certainly a good thing. Drugs came back with a vengeance today, and they're almost out of this little range. They look like they were going to break down the range. At first, it looked like a kind of a, a bigger double top knockout. Then it looked like they were rolling over, and then they went straight back up. So we're getting close to breaking out on drugs. That's a good thing. Biotech right here at one year plus highs. You can go all the way back to January 2022. Now, biotech's all over the place, but this is certainly an improvement. And when I see a market like this, a sector like this, making these new one year plus highs, and I start seeing setups in biotech, then I can get a little bit more excited about them. I saw one of you guys recently was a biotech bull. I'm I'm kind of a, a closet bull when it comes to biotech. Because if you catch a great little like a bow tie or something, and it's especially like like one thing uh John and I were talking about this in Facebook or we were talking about Facebook everybody I, I suppose but um he was talking about like these IPOs that go down and bottom out and I said kind of like a phoenix type of strategy and the phoenix strategy is just like a bow tie or something something that just bottoms out for a long long time and then begins to rise from the ashes uh I can't show it can I show it yeah btbt we're long BTBT. So this would be kind of a Phoenix-ish type of pattern. Notice I just went, went down here and bottomed out for a long time. Now this is the pullback. It's a little bit more mature trend, but you can see that it did kind of bottom out for a long time. It's not exactly what I'm talking about, but you get the idea. And sometimes these weeks, months, and, and even years, the longer the better. And that big, uh, I think William O'Neill, rest his soul, would call that a saucer. 
and so would uh, who came along before William O'Neill, Schaubacher, and um, who else? Edwards and McGee, and all those guys. I have a friend that met Edwards or McGee, I forget which one. Manufacturing, one year plus highs, almost all time highs. So that's a good thing, right? Materials of construction, which is mostly home builders. Look at that, banging out some new highs with vigor. And guess what? Just seeing this myself, because I didn't I didn't have my chart scroll back, but that's all time highs. I knew we were getting close. I didn't know we we're actually at all time highs. So that is a good thing. Leisure's at these multi or one year plus highs, I should say, but uh, last time I or recently, I should say, I had some casinos showing up, kind of wide and loose, but showing up as possible shorts. I don't pay a lot of attention to the transports other than I look at all these charts every day, but at transports are waking up a little bit at multi-month high, so that's certainly a good thing. Look at software, I feel like tiny O's. Look at, look at that trend, it's huge, okay? Software tacked on another 2% today, not too far away from these all-time highs. So, so far, so good for software. Hardware, aka Apple, I think this, this sector is mostly just Apple. We'll take a look at Apple, but banging out multi-year highs. Yeah, so you can see Apple pretty much a reflection of that. Apple's at all-time highs, look at that. Look at that trend, it's huge. So software doing really good. Semiconductors doing pretty good as of late today notwithstanding but they could use a little bit of a break they've been in a tear as of late and they're not too far from all-time highs as i say nearly every day to my clients <laughs> i'm a big fan of the semis confirming what's happening in the overall market or backing up so so to speak so for t's and nasdaq are begging out some new highs i sure would like to see the semiconductors do the same there's there's your Q's, you can see kind of gradual trend in here and now accelerating higher. So that is a good thing. Okay, let's take a look at some of these stocks. Rockwell, let's get a, a blank chart. Let's see. Landerless. Oops. Uh, here we go. Okay, RMTI. Um it does have some bad memories back here. The thing that kind of scares me away from it a little bit is that it just kind of went up in this big chunk over a couple of days. See how I did back here, even though this was just a couple of chunks, but notice how it was gradually moving up and then accelerated higher before it pulled back, a little bit too deep in that pullback there. I would probably pass based on some of this historical action and the fact that it had these big gaps in here but there there's a lot of other stocks out there so don't uh, don't worry about that okay we got dhi and never mind on dhi all right well let's just look at it anyway yeah you might want to put that on your watch list that's um that's a home builder obviously uh it's in a trend what did i recommend a while back bldr um i had to i needed to come up with a stock for few weeks back, I was on the stock chart show, The Five, I think, and it was hard to find anything, but I did find this TKO, which was okay. It wasn't perfect. And my point here was don't buy it unless it goes up, right? Unless it takes out that TKO high. So BLDR, that might be one you want, might want to put on your momentum list. So yeah, nothing wrong with that, but just put on your momentum list, not set up, obviously. All right, we got two votes. Two of you guys are looking for same stock, so that means something. AC, somebody did their homework. Let's see. Yeah, I like it. I do. Um, ideally, and that's, that's like that BLDR, okay? And I was forced to come up with something. And I, and I, I kind of couched a little bit and said, hey, it's, I prefer if I find something at a little bit lower levels. But this is a good looking stock, okay? And it needs a little bit more knockout, though, especially given this trend that's just had. So possibly a little bit more knockout. You got enough volume. So that looks pretty good. That needs to be in your momentum list for sure. Ideally, since we're kind of still in a bit of an early phase to a bull market, I'd like to find something that, that hasn't really taken off or taken off as much just yet. But we got two votes, two of you guys both want to know about that same stock. So that's interesting. 
GRBK. Uh, this is another one of those cases where you can see that it made most of the trim is just in this this quick gap higher. And I actually like to see the wide range bar come after like smaller wide range bars. Okay, like notice back here you had kind of these small bars and then it begins to expand higher. That's what I like to see in a trend as opposed to more of this one, not necessarily one and done in this case, but you can see it really took off and then it kind of it continued high, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't kind of like a more orderly trend like back here. Now, it would have to pull back more, Brian, and if it did pull back more, then it would be back below this prior peak in here. So put it in your momentum list, but I would pass for now. Okay, uh, I think I think we're pretty much close to done. Does anybody have any more stocks you want to talk about real quick? BTS for George. BTS. I'm gonna like that one. Yeah, I've been watching this one. This one, I think we got. I think we. I don't know if we made money or not in this one. I think I played the buy at B, and then later it might have been a service wreck, and I don't know whether it worked or not. But the buy at B was. No, the buy at B. The range was too small for this. Never got out. Oh, George is still long. Oh, thank God, somebody, somebody made money on that. <laughs> Yeah, I ended up losing money on this one, I think. I'm trying to think if I played uh, played it earlier in the IPO process. Well, I I, I don't want to reward bad behavior, but uh, good for you. Did how how much did you how much did you let it go past the stop? If you don't mind me asking. Well, I'm glad. Well, I'm glad somebody made money on it. <laughs> but yeah, that's looking pretty good. In fact, I've got this. See, this is um. Oh, this is IPOs, but um, I thought I was in my momentum list, but it's in my momentum list. It needs a little bit more pullback, but I've been watching this one. This is this is definitely on my radar. Oh, you figured in the dividend. Oh, oh man. Oh, that's going to pain me if I go shit. <laughs> nice work. Oh, my God. Uh. Yeah, I need to see. Oh my goodness, I need to think about that. Yeah, with, I know with like the ARLP, I didn't adjust for dividends because our stop was so far away. But yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's it's you know it's a tough business. There's a lot of things to do, and and that's something like the like the fifty cent dividend on that or whatever it was. I should have I should have widened that stop out. Yeah, so that's that's my bad. So. Kudos to you if you uh, you figured that out, was able to ride it out. Wow, fantastic! That's exciting. So John said he was in at the buy at B, but got stopped out. Been watching it too. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah, I got I got shaken out of that one. Huh? Add it to the bottom of the stop. Yeah, yeah. So what he's saying is there was a dividend, and a stock's going to drop by that dividend amount. So what you do is you Let's say your stop's at 10, and it's a 50 cent dividend. You lower your stop to 950 because you're going to get that 50 cent back in dividend, right? So yeah, wow. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to do a walkthrough on that. That's gonna that might be a painful one there. <laughs> but hey, you know that's that's the beauty of having this business is if somebody could somebody else could could prosper when I don't always do things exactly as I should. That's that's great too. But you see what I, what I was saying earlier? How many, it's a lot easier to ride out even a riot but ride out like sym because i know you guys are in it too and believe me i was dropping f-bombs up in here okay because it's like oh here we go again and it's hard sometimes you know especially with trend following because these trends sometimes are too few and far between although i think things are getting better which is exciting all right any more real quick well, obviously while we're in impasse i want to thank everybody for attending tonight thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Again, if you're watching on Facebook, davelander.com slash webinar. Would love to have you here. Leave a comment below. And again, if you like it, like it. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> Everybody enjoy your holiday weekend. And may the trend be with you. Okay. Oh, got a question. Are the Apple Podcasts a recast of Thursday? Yes. Yeah, so what I do tomorrow is I, I strip out the audio and then I publish that to uh, the podcast. And I'm hoping it's still getting picked up. 
I don't know if it's still going to be picked up or not, but you could always find it on the website if not. All right, again, thanks everybody and may the trend be with you. You're welcome.